I think a lot of you guys have it. Um, if you have it, they'll talk about, um, there's the book right there. Um, and uh, today is just a sharing of different ideas, different discussions about how we can grow our communities. Um, so without further ado, um, I'll let them introduce themselves and they can steal away the show. All right, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us this morning. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to uh, very loosely uh, moderate and facilitate this conversation, but it's really about Ian and Audrey today. We've, we've had a previous discussion, so we're going to pick up on those and try to have an engaging and interesting conversation. Unfortunately, because of the technicalities, Ian will, you probably won't be able to ask questions from Ian, but Audrey will stay in that room with you guys. She's not running away anywhere. So you can have her and ask her all the questions you want afterwards. Um, so with that said, let me, you know, uh, David just kind of introduced and you all obviously know who Audrey is, but I want to start my question first with Audrey and then, um, and part of that, Audrey, please do give us a little more background to introduce yourself. But, you know, we talked about how I should maybe introduce you as the person who put dot in Asia.sv. What right. is that about? So, uh, when I entered the cabinet, it was uh, four years ago, uh, roughly speaking, uh, there was this uh, new idea called Yangzhou Sigu or Asian Silicon Valley. And I thought it was silly. Uh, a lot of my friends thought it was silly, actually, because we've been to Silicon Valley. And so we understand this is not about uh, bringing Silicon Valley to, to Asia or to turn Asia into Silicon Valley. But but however, we do see the uh, importance of connections. Uh, and so I put this dot uh, and called it instead of Asia dot Silicon Valley. So instead of Asia being an objective like Asian, Yajo de Sigu, right? Uh, this is about Yajo Lianzia Sigu to connect Asia and Silicon Valley. And subsequently, we found that actually the Silicon Valley uh, way of thinking, if it's more short term, if it's more about uh, creating short term returns and so on, actually has a lot of externality. We have seen the infodemic, for example, as a result of that. And people in Asia are very creative, and we have created a lot of ways actually to counter the, the infodemic. So uh, the connection is in both ways. It's not just about using Silicon Valley thinking to solve Asian problems, uh, but also using Asian thinking to solve problems caused by Silicon Valley. Uh, and this makes for a much more bilateral uh, communication. That's great. And I'm going to get come back to that. But before I go, dig deeper into that topic. I want to ask Ian, who's the co-author of the Startup Communities book. And I feel like the book is exactly about this. It's about different communities around the world wanting to become a thriving ecosystem. Can you tell us a little bit about the book and then also a little bit more about your experience? Yeah, um, thanks, Oko. Um, so yeah, so the book is really the culmination of um, three years of work with my co-author Brad Feld and I. Um, not three years uh, consistently. There were a lot of breaks in between, a lot of, uh, you know, marinating on these ideas. Um, uh, for those who may not be aware, Brad uh, wrote a book in 2012 uh, called Startup Communities, which kind of kicked off this global phenomena. And we partnered um, over the last couple of years. This book was just published in July, which is really um, an evolution on, on the movement that Brad uh, kicked off. Um, the, his first book focused a lot on Boulder, the principles that could be learned in Boulder, Colorado, his experience building the startup community there. What we're trying to do here is be more generalizable. Um, we focus uh, a lot on the systemic properties, you know, uh, we, we use the word ecosystem a lot, um, but too often we found that um, approaches to improve entrepreneurship in a community uh, overlooks the systemic nature. And so we really focus on that. Um, Audrey said the word um, directly, which was connections, right? That's really what this is about, about strong human relationships um, built around collaboration and support. Um, and that's really what the book is about. Uh, we could go a bit deeper if you'd like, um, but a lot of it uh, has been, you know, um, put into action with the local team in, in Taiwan, and it's been fun to be a part of that journey. Great, thank you, Ian. And Audrey, coming back to you, this agenda of Taiwan trying to become the Asian Silicon Valley, whether you like the terminology or not, it's a, it's a big agenda wow. and it's been a- Asian Silicon Valley. Sorry for <laughs> interrupting. <laughs> no problem. 
it's a big agenda. It's been around for a while now. From, from your perspective in, in the office, um, what has the progress been? What are you proud of? And you know, how would you analyze the results so far? Yeah, um, a lot of the work that we've done is to ensure that there is a compelling reason for talents uh, to circulate. Uh, like I personally uh, went to Silicon Valley uh, to start some companies and uh, thanks to the invention of telework, uh, maintained this teleworking relationship with the Silicon Valley um, community like even now, right? I'm digital minister the TW slash um, co-founders, board member, many other uh, international uh, organizations. And, and I'm not alone in this. There's many, uh, both Taiwanese people who go overseas but want to return to amplify their work as well as people who have heard of Taiwan and chose this as their startup destination. And toward that end, uh, we've introduced, for example, the Taiwan Gold Card, uh, which you can check out at taiwangoldcard.com. Uh, and uh, it's a community that, uh, with people who hold uh, this open work permits uh, in joint healthcare along with their family and so on. And it's all very streamlined without uh, needing to invest a lot uh, of money in Taiwan or to find a Taiwanese employer. What we're saying is that essentially just um, hang out with us um, and share your talents and uh, things like that. And it, it really worked. Uh, I mean, uh, now, now we're around almost 2,000 uh, gold card issued uh, this way, um, up from like less than 200 before the pandemic. Uh, and during the pandemic, there's also more than uh, 250k uh, people returning uh, from all over the world uh, back to Taiwan to work on whatever they are already working on, but through teleworking and so on. So I think the COVID and the teleworking uh, initiatives uh, in particular has really fostered this talent circulation. And we've signaled that we uh, are really in this for the long run. The open work permit is uh, three years. And unlike Singapore, you can reapply uh, after the three years. Uh, and while we're uh, relaxing the criteria as uh, the um, Christmas gift uh, last year uh, from the Minister of Science and Technology, Mr. Wu Jianzhong, is that anyone who has the potential to contribute to science and technology is now eligible for a gold card. So that's pretty much everyone in the startup community. That's great. And I, I want to follow up on the question. Do you think that it's, it's easier and to be an entrepreneur in Taiwan now? Than, yeah, definitely. Compared to four years ago, definitely. Yes. Yeah. And what are some of larger kind of infrastructures or, or new things in place that entrepreneurs can take advantage of in Taiwan now, besides yeah. the gold card? That's right. So uh, in 2015, uh, we've uh, reformed our company law a little bit uh, to promote the closely held uh, corporations that would uh, be able for you as a co-founder or as a founder to, to raise uh, money up to like Series A or something uh, without diluting your voting rights. And that used to be uh, very difficult. You have to set up a, a company at Cayman Islands or something, uh, but now you can do so uh, using local law. Now uh, in 2017, we further expanded it so it applies to uh, basically any company that's not public issued uh, and so uh, the like new inventions uh, of from silicon valley including for example um, the crowdfunding and crowdfunding for shares for example uh, and these things uh, sdos even uh, these structures become legally possible in taiwan that's great um i want to jump over to Ian, Ian, so is Silicon Valley the best ecosystem in the world? And, uh, and what have you found in your research looking around communities around the world? Well, I think the best ecosystem is the one you've been and the one you want to spend the rest of your life improving, right? And building the next great company. Um, I think that the lessons are from Silicon Valley are, of course, that place matters right? It's easier to build a great company in Silicon Valley than in many other places. Maybe we should uh, amend that to say it used to be easier to build a company there, right? The things have been evolving, but place matters. Um, you know, I'll, qu I'll quote a friend of mine who is a French entrepreneur turned investor. And he said, I encourage all of my entrepreneurs to spend time in Silicon Valley, not just to to learn and see how things are done and to build a network, but to see that no one is special there, that it's, they aren't necessarily uh, the smartest people, right? They don't have necessarily the best ideas. It's that they're doing it in a place where this culture 
um, which has unfolded over many decades has taken shape and it just makes the journey easier. It doesn't make it certain. Um, let's also not forget to double down on what Audrey was just discussing. Silicon Valley was really built by entrepreneurs, uh, by immigrants. Um, you know, uh, I think one, one estimate that I saw from a study in the middle of the 2000s, uh, something along the lines of half of all technology venture-backed startups in the Valley over the previous several decades had at least one immigrant founder, right? And we know now that the United States um, is uh, over the last four years and really predating that um, uh, much, much further has begun to turn its back on, on immigrants. And now we're seeing that capital is flowing to more places, more communities around the world. Opportunity is opening up in those markets and smart governments can stay competitive by having an open door. I mean, this is really about talent, right? That's what the whole game is. And to say, you're welcome here, you have a place here, I think is really good government policy. Um, the final thing that I'll say is that also what has made Silicon Valley great is its resilience, right? Its adaptability, going back to that culture element um, you know, Silicon Valley made its way really in electronics, in chips and hardware, right? That might sound familiar to folks in Taiwan. Um, it's also been one of the leading centers of biotech, and it really wasn't even positioned to be that. Um, but it became that because of the orientation of how um, venture capitalists and entrepreneurs would take existing means and create um, and create uh, meaningful companies, right? So. Silicon Valley is, is proof that it can happen anywhere by applying the right mindset, by being adaptable, being open, being collaborative, putting the entrepreneurs as the star, right? Um, makes those combinations, those winning combinations of great, great ideas becoming great companies and creating large markets, it just makes it more likely. And so I think those are some of the main takeaways from Silicon Valley. I don't think you should ever try to emulate it. We can, we can learn from those principles, um, but really each place is so unique. And if to the degree that you do want to adopt uh, lessons from Silicon Valley, I would look back several decades about what actually got the flywheel spinning to begin with, not necessarily what's happening today. <laughs> Ian, I know you've done your, you built your own startup as an entrepreneur and you sold it. And, and uh, if you were to do a new startup now, would you want to do it in the Silicon Valley? Audrey, same question back to you. Would you want to be back there? Well, for me, it's no, um, because I don't want to spend the rest of my life there. I don't want to live there. So um, it's, it's a definite no for me. Okay, um, I'm a, uh, currently working in the Taipei City, uh, but my residency uh, is in the new Taipei City. I recently met with the mayor uh, and the deputy mayor of new Taipei City, and they have this great sign that everyone who lives or uh, have their residence uh, in the new Taipei City are new citizens. So, right? so uh, we are all immigrants and immigrants, we get a job done. Uh, so I'm happy to uh, stay in Taiwan and work in Taiwan. Um, great. Um, Ajay, follow up. So what other ecosystems or communities do you look to um, when you are perhaps looking for creativity or inspiration and in terms of comparison? I don't want to use this word because I know Ian is very allergic to this word, but uh, um, what other ecosystems and communities do you look at? Inspiration. Yes. Uh, so um, I'm, as I said, I'm digital minister dot tw uh, slash um, board member radical exchange, uh, and radical exchange is this um, basically uh, on chain governance trying to project it to the real world, quote unquote real world. Uh, so uh, my co-founder uh, Vitalik Buterin uh, is now working with uh, many like quadratic voting, quadratic funding, a lot of uh, like Gitcoin, which is a, a real implementation of funding practice uh, and things like that. And the good thing about the um, Ethereum, um, is it a co-governor now? 
is this song right now? Maybe not. Uh, the Israeli community uh, is that uh, they, they are very willing to look at democracy and see democracy as a technology. Now, that's quite rare, actually, in jurisdictions uh, around the world to see democracy as something malleable, as something that you can try different layouts, like semiconductor layouts. Um, and so what we are doing is essentially looking at the lessons learned from the Gitcoin experiment, from the Ethereum domain name system, and things like that, and apply the lessons learned to, for example, the Taiwanese presidential hackathon, which for the past couple of years has used quadratic voting to choose the teams to receive incubation for three months, and the top five uh, teams receive a trophy from the president, which is a micro projector that when turned on projects the president's plane when uh, we call it Shen Zhu Pai here. So her likeness, uh, promising, <laughs> promising, uh, blessing, right? That's the word, blessing uh, the team, uh, whatever the team did for the past three months, uh, she promised to make it into national policy within the next 12 months or so. Uh, that's executive power as hackathon award. And we learned that including the voting method directly from the Ethereum community. Wow, those are some really interesting things that we should be all looking at. Um, as a digital minister, what is your day to day looks like? Earlier, you said you attend 50 mm -hmm. events a week. 10, 10, 10 meetings per day, yes. Per day. From seven to seven, yes. Uh, so what does a digital minister do? Day. Yeah. Maybe just nine meetings a day, right? <laughs> So, so uh, I usually uh, have my first engagement around 7 a.m. and usually uh, with uh, North and South American communities. Now, uh, the evening engagements are with African and European uh, communities. And uh, what I usually do is to focus on the common values like the sustainable development goals and sharing not only the telemodel to counter the pandemic uh, with no lockdown, but also countering the infodemic uh, with no takedown and many other structural issues with people in the uh, come up with called wicked problems uh, and I share the wiki solutions to the wicked problems. Awesome. So I, I want to now take this and take uh, our two hour kind of third section of, of the conversation I wanted to have, which is Ian, um, you know, in your research, what did you find, how, what did you find government to be effective in, in developing ecosystems? What roles did they play where it worked and perhaps what they didn't do so well? Um, yeah, so government um, has a big role to play. Um, I have a different view maybe on what that should be from what a lot of government officials might think that role should be. Um, I think the first thing, and this is um, not as fun, not as sexy, but it's like getting the house in order is what I like to say, making sure your tax regimes and your regulatory um, regimes are fair, are transparent, are easy to understand, including in that immigration policy, right? That's a regulation around labor. Doing things that only the government can do, right? Focusing on doing those things well. Um, I think that governments who um, are looking to seed, to diversify their approach right, uh, to see many different actors who are actually engaged, who are carrying out these experiments, right? I think governments can set high level vision and strategy. They can provide funding. They can provide other forms of support, convening and connecting. But ultimately, I feel like when government tries to go down the road of delivering um, entrepreneurship, you know, services for entrepreneurs like acceleration, incubation, investment, I think that's a step too far. So one um, way of framing this is government can help build the platform or the dance floor, but ultimately you have to let the dancers dance, uh, right? And so that's a good way of thinking about it. Um, and so those are the kind of things that, that, that I think about, um, about what, what government strategy, uh, what, what government approaches work well and, and what don't. Now, RJ, I know some of these is exactly what you're working on. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> So there's no, that, but that's, uh, that's really what I have to say. I, I completely agree. Uh, in Taiwan, we make sure that for, when the, for example, our National Development Fund from the National Development Council uh, invest uh, in a company. We always uh, work with the agile community uh, and we never get um, like uh, more than 49.99% of the controlling share. Uh, otherwise, uh, the startup becomes state owned enterprises and, and that's not giving uh, people the freedom to dance. Uh, 
Ian, obviously we've been doing work in, in Taiwan for over two years now. And one of the first things we did was to do an assessment, right? Can you, can you maybe share a little bit about what we've learned in Taiwan uh, before we started our work? Yeah, so this is a little bit repetitive of what I just talked about, um, but one of the things that stuck with me, both from our assessment and my own experience visiting uh, Taipei, was that the government was making some smart decisions around, you know, diversifying the strategy, looking for market participants to actually implement, right? The policy is, let's improve digitally enabled, digitally driven technology entrepreneurship. That's the goal. Let's put some resources behind it, but let's have these other actors, many different ones, implementing the policy. Um, the second thing is that I see, which is positive, is um, a commitment, right? A sustained commitment, right? It's very early days. If you look at a bunch of these government initiatives, you know, we're talking what, five, less than a decade, five years, three years or so. This takes a long time. And so having that long term commitment, is critical. In fact, I think this is, you know, I try to think about what's the what's the number one thing that confuses or confounds in entrepreneurial ecosystems, and I think it is that time cycle. These time lags are tremendous. So just remembering that it's early days. On the negative side, um, one of the things that I observed was that so much of the attention was on very early stage companies that it felt like there might have been a support gap for companies that are gaining traction and growing. Um, I am a big believer in throwing a lot at the innovation economy. Um, there's a economist, an American economist term, who turned venture capitalist named Bill Janeway, and he has this great quote, and he says, uh, uh, efficiency is the enemy of innovation. So don't try to make these policies efficient. Just know that you've got to try a lot of things. You know, a bunch of it won't work, but the things that will are going to drive value for the whole thing. And you're not going to be able to predict in advance what those things are. Um, so I felt like it's great to have lots of this early stage experimentation, keep doing that, stick with it, but then also look for the companies that are gaining traction and find ways to support them as well. Make sure those mechanisms are there. The second thing that I would say is that I felt like the entrepreneurship, the entrepreneurs themselves could be doing more to self-organize and lead amongst themselves. So I feel like the government has done a great job to provide all these resources and opportunities. But one thing that I think could be done more is to encourage those entrepreneurs to lead. Now I know it's very easy for, for the founders to say, look, I'm busy building my company, I can't do this right now. And I think inevitably there is this cycle, right? There are gonna be times when founders really need to focus only on the company. But um, my, my plea would be over the long term that an, <clears throat> a startup community that is led principally by entrepreneurs, not entirely, is a more uh, relevant and sustainable one. And so those are some of the things that I would have said some great strengths, but also some things to work on. <clears throat> Audrey, every time we share these findings, we get some reaction from the local community. Uh, mm -hmm. This is the first time you heard some of these things. What do you think? What do you agree with? What do you disagree with? Yeah, I'll expand the argument a little bit. Um, so um, the call to action uh, in my community, the Gup Zero G Zero community, yeah, is called Fork in the government, pronunciation very important, fork the government. Uh, fork in open source, meaning uh, take some things uh, already there, but taking it into a more innovative uh, new direction, uh, like uh, actually people on the cryptocurrency and digital ledger community knows a lot about forks. Uh, and I'm talking about soft forks, that is the experiment that's designed to be much back. So for example, if I go to card.com, the website that I just mentioned, it's not a government project. It's literally a GitHub project. Uh, I also um, sent a pull request uh, when they visited me, uh, and it's uh, literally built by people who got to go to cards and really want to share it uh, with their friends and families. Now, <clears throat> one of the lead uh, architects of that website actually uh, now uh, works with the National Development Council, not for, with, uh, and uh, builds our official portal for build card owners. Uh, and you see this uh, story repeating again and again, uh, like our uh, counter pandemic portal, Taiwan can help that us. 
uh, that's not a government website. It's literally crowdfunded uh, on the, the, the com, uh, and uh, with the original goal of just putting an advertisement in the New York Times. Uh, but it evolved into this like YouTuber showcase uh, channel where international YouTubers share the talent model uh, and compete on the best way uh, to share their lessons. Uh, I think they're even joined by our then Vice President Chen Jiang, who recorded a YouTube clip uh, about epidemiology, right? Uh, and, and that's then fed back uh, to the Ministry of Health and Welfare's communication efforts because we all use uh, Creative Commons licenses and open data licenses. Uh, it made sure that all those works eventually could get merged into government platform. And so the founders can then uh, move on uh, to the next thing. Uh, while the public service maintains uh, this uh, scaffold turned into a building, but the scaffolding I think is very important. By the way, I just want to point out that the audio somehow is working really, really well. <laughs> this is surprising oh, for yeah. organizing. Yeah. The problem as a human right, you're enjoying the human right. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I want to go back to uh, what you mentioned, Taiwan can help, right? This is a big campaign, like you mm -hmm. said, and uh, it's, it's I, I, you know, for someone who's looking from outside in, I feel like it really uh, hit well. It, it, it was very popular and it's being picked up, like you mentioned, around the world. Um, what is the vision or what do you think can, you know, some of the big outcomes you hope to get out of this? Yeah, um, I think uh, one of the main ideas of Taiwan can help is that we're not very uh, picky about the topic that we can be of help. Uh, this is my name card, by the way. Uh, and, it, and it says uh, Taiwan can help uh, next to the 17 uh, UN Global Goals. There's even a like moving forward logo to it. So like full startup thing, right? You can get swags, t-shirts, uh, baseball caps, or whatever, <laughs> and having that logo. And so uh, the hashtag Taiwan can help is not something that's only used by Taiwanese people. It's actually remixed uh, in every which way. Uh, we have, for example, of Japanese people putting that into their rap songs. Um, there, there's like literally a rap song about Taiwan can help uh, <laughs> done by the Japanese team, uh, those monos. Uh, and there's uh, many other jurisdictions that then uh, think about Taiwan and think about maybe just one or two things that were traditionally known uh, to help with, right? So we're, we talked about, of course, the semiconductors and the ICP uh, and things like that, but we are, of course, quite strong as well on the medical assistance, humanitarian assistance, agricultural um, technologies and every other thing. Uh, but by looking at the 17 global goals and and seeing how kind of next to it, then people learn that, oh, this is also about a uh, circular economy. Uh, and this is also about community building and things like that. And we take every chance, for example, I often say this jacket is made out of recycled plastic and waste and that circular economy and things like that. And so we all correspond to the global goals. And so I think the main message is that we are here to help you, uh, no matter which shared global goals you're working on. And that's a larger community, much more than any specific global goal. You know, I just, again, quick follow-up question. Um, you know, when I hear you talk about many of these projects, you seem to be very much in touch with the entrepreneurs themselves in the community. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I haven't seen many government people who who who, who are always we, doing that. Are, um, in addition to being the administrator, <laughs> yes, uh, I'm still actively participating in community. Can you can you tell us how you actually do that uh, tactically? Like, you know, how do you make sure you're staying connected? How do you make sure you're still listening to them? Uh, well, tactically, it means that I uh, sleep for eight hours every day to keep my mind fresh. Uh, I make sure that I don't. Uh, accept the public service um, like event request during the weekends, which is quite rare actually for uh, members of the cabinet who are most uh, most busy during the weekends. But weekend is for for me, uh, for family, and for the sort of communities that I engage with. And also, um, I um, so I when when we're talking, I just saw uh, your message on Slack and things like that. And I, I'm like that, right? So uh, when I, when I go after work, you know, and in the weekends, I'm just on Slack. Time and uh, responding uh, to the new request. For example, last uh, February, uh, there was a guy named Howard Wu uh, from Tainan City uh, who posted on the Zero Slack saying, Hey, I owed Google 26K US dollars in map usage fees because they built this uh, map that shows availability of masks. And that was uh, enabled me to respond uh, within hours saying, Hey, uh, don't pay the bill, I'll uh, talk to Google and things like that. <laughs> so this is all about a, a real-time connectivity with the community on Slack. Uh, 
channels. Uh, everybody in the audience, make sure you get the direct Slack address of Audrey so you can get your uh, debts. <laughs> yes, please, Ian, do you want to add something? Yeah, I think I want to, I, I think I've said this now three times, but I want to double down on something that Audrey just said because it's so important, which is this idea of, of, of the government appointing key personnel uh, to roles of influence, right? You don't, in fact, appointing people into official government roles um, who have experience as entrepreneurs or in tech, who have those existing relationships in the startup community, the knowledge base, can actually be a very simple way of driving the agenda forward. Um, my, my, suggestion around that um, is similar to how you would vet a program, right? Um, do the work up front, right? Make sure you've got the right people in those roles and put as few restrictions on them as possible. Let them do their thing, right? Um, I just feel like it's the, I guess I'm talking about this in, the, in a, through a few different ways. I've talked about the policy sort of vision and then the policy implementation. And when it comes to startups, the implementation is so important because the way that, that entrepreneurship is organized, the way that startup communities function is so diametrically opposed to how most institutions work like governments and corporations and universities that it's just, it's a lot better to, to appoint personnel, um, not necessarily to uh, a, even a long-term role. I mean, I, I'm familiar with the, the, the city government of Seattle has a role called the startup advocate. And it's typically an entrepreneur who is in between companies, they're in between roles. Sometimes they do it for six months, sometimes they do it for two, two years. But they're basically the point person, uh, the interface between that local government and the startup community. And it's been very effective. Um, and it's a low cost, a relatively low cost way to make sure they've got the right information, right? And that they're uh, um, responding to the community's needs in an agile way um, and being proactive in what those needs might be as it relates out to the government. So I really wanna emphasize, you know, what Audrey was saying and just to say that, that I feel like that's a, that's a simple strategy that government should be adopting everywhere. And I think Taiwanese government is very fortunate to have somebody like Audrey who's actually playing that role really well. Uh, Ian, we do have last four minutes here. Anything else you wanna add before we log you off and then I'll have one question from Audrey. Um, no, I just think that I just want to extend some words of encouragement. Um, I, it's been a real honor and a pleasure to have a front row seat to um, the startup community in Taiwan. Um, very disappointed that I'm not visiting in person. Uh, I'd like to actually be a public health refugee maybe. Uh, from the United States. <laughs> I, need my, I, need, I need my gold card. Um, but you're doing all the right things. It just stick with it, you know, be patient, keep at it. Know that things can change quickly, right? This isn't a linear progression. You know, you're pushing this boulder uphill and it feels like maybe some days it's not going anywhere. And then next thing you know, you're at the top of the hill and it starts accelerating, right? Maybe that's a bad metaphor, but um, the idea being you just have to keep pushing and you're doing the right things. You're just sticking with it is critical. So it's been fun to be a part of that ride and I look forward to spending more time with the community. Thank you very much, Ian. I know Ian just wants to go back for Ding Tai Fung. He, yes. That's his favorite favorite restaurant. Uh, yeah, and I just want to say just for the audience that during was the Meet Taipei and, and Startup Week. I had three different nights of different Zoom backgrounds of Din Tai Fung. So this is a strong endorsement for me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Ian. Uh, and Audrey, my last question is, you know, I really liked how you explained your bio um, uh, the other day to us, uh, uh, kind of elements and, and traits or, or sort of mindsets you follow mm -hmm. and goals. If you could maybe share with us that, I, I feel like that's a great way to end this conversation. Sure, definitely. 
Um, so this is uh, all about long, longer term thinking, uh, the theme that we discussed today and, and during our preparatory meeting, uh, I tried to put words to what I mean by, by long term, right? And I said, uh, if the work that we are doing uh, makes the world a better place uh, when I log off uh, compared to when I log in uh, to the world, then, then it's, it's a better thing. Uh, and I think uh, that's you know, sustainability and that's a really good ultimate vision. And I would like to refer it to be a mainstream vision uh, as opposed to this uh, singularity uh, vision. And that's indeed my, my job description, uh, which goes like this. But we see the internet of things. Let's make it an internet of beings. When we see virtual reality, let's make it a shared reality. When we see machine learning, let's make it collaborative learning. When we see user experience, let's make it about human experience. And whenever we hear that a singularity is near, let's always remember the plurality is here. So live on and prosper and have a good look at time. Awesome. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you to both of my speakers today. Uh, enjoyed it thoroughly. I hope the uh, audience did too. We learned a lot. And uh, again, audience, you guys have Audrey with you. So you can continue uh, having asking questions and having this conversation. Uh, for me, we're checking out here. We're logging off. Hey, yeah. 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 Oh, we're doing a photo. Okay, not quite yet. Right. And quick news that um, Oko, Ian, they plan to fly over to Taiwan in March. So we are looking forward to that. Uh, hopefully, we saw our digital minister's help. Of course. So <laughs> we'll take a picture with Ian and Oko and the team this way. And later, Audrey will move over here to take the picture with Mark. So she can take a picture. Um, she's gonna hide Audrey. So Audrey can stand. No, it's good. It's good. Okay. But we're fine. We're fine. Yeah, may, maybe like this. Yeah. Okay. Maybe just like this. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, she wants to start with the second one. Too.